Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Core Recruitment has been doing a series of webinars through the COVID-19 crisis. And for Pride Month, we have been doing a couple of interviews. Last week, we were joined by Mark Foster, and this week, we're very lucky to be joined by Keegan Hurst. Thank you for joining us, Keegan. Thanks for having me, mate. Very welcome. Um, now, um, we're going to get to speak to Keegan in just kind of a couple of minutes. I've just got to say that on the core LGBT side of things, we've been uh, running now for about 18 months. We normally like to do kind of actual physical meeting up events, and we've had some brilliant ones so far with the Green King, the Curtain Members Club, Box Park, etc. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to do some more physical events later on this year. So if you are watching this and you'd like to get involved in actually meeting up, then please do. Um, and um, more so, if you've got any venues that you perhaps like to volunteer, then that would also be great as well. So if, um, if you feel like doing that, then please do let me know. So back to Keegan, and if you haven't heard of Keegan before, Keegan's a professional rugby league player um, who plays currently as a prop for Halifax. He previously played for Batley Bulldogs, also for Wakefield Trinity in the Super League, and he made his debut in 2007 playing for Dewsbury. In 2015, he was the first professional rugby league player to come out as being gay. Keegan, is there anything else you'd like to introduce about yourself? Um, no, no, I'm sure we'll get into it all, all as, as we go through it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've had more clubs than Nick Faldo, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, so, firstly and most topically, um, can you tell us a little bit about lockdown? And um, have you been getting out to train anywhere? Um, so I'm really lucky. I managed to commandeer a walk bike and a few dumbbells from from the gym. Um, so I've managed to train in the house. Um, I've also just had my back garden run, so it's been nice to be able to train out there. Um, I started running at the beginning of lockdown, but I can tell you that I am not built for running. Um, I did a half marathon just to say that I'd done one, and I won't be... Uh, won't be venturing into that again for a while. So um, yeah, I've, I've still managed to keep ticking over. I have, um, I also have a, a, an online personal training business as well. So I have loads of guys. So you know, it's important to practice what you preach. So I have been, um, I have been pretty, pretty busy and pretty active. Excellent. Now there's lots of people that are talking about when sport comes back that it's going to be played behind uh, closed doors without audiences. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Um, I mean, obviously, safety is paramount for everybody, uh, fans, players, staff. Um, so whatever they need to do to, to make it safe. I think when you're looking at sports like rugby league that are not as cash rich as football, um, I don't necessarily know if that's feasible, certainly in the lower leagues, um, because there's no TV coverage down there. Um, obviously, there is in Super League, uh, so they should be okay. But I think the the lower leagues, you know, need they need the money from people turning up at, at, at stadiums. So I honestly can't see how that's going to happen for for the lower league clubs. But yeah, safety is safety is paramount. And how do you think rugby generally has responded to the pandemic? Um, I think uh, I think they've probably done as well as they could. The the the. I think the pandemic has shown, you know, not just in rugby league, in businesses up and down, um, has shown a lot of businesses' priorities have come to the fore, um, whether that's money or the people that they employ. Um, and I think rugby leagues is primarily about the money, um, which doesn't surprise me. It's a bit sad. Um, but, yeah, I think the, uh, the care they've shown for the players has been minimal, unfortunately. <laughs> Understood. How did you get into rugby initially, Keegan? Um, I got into rugby by accident. Um, I, I was not a sporty kid at all. I was a fat, geeky kid. Um, lived on a council estate with my mum, who uh, she didn't really want us playing out. She didn't want us getting in bother, um, you know, hanging, hanging around with the wrong crowd, um, which meant I pretty much stayed in red books, played computer games. Um, but I was always a big lad, and one day the local coach, um, his son was in my class, he saw me, um, thought, he's a big lad, he'll be able to play rugby, spoke to my mum, and turned up at my house that day, and um, I went training. Um, I was shit at it, um, but I, lo I loved it, I loved the camaraderie, I loved everything about it, and I, I stuck with it, and I was shit at it for quite a few years, and then puberty happened, and puberty was quite good to me, and suddenly I ended up being quite athletic and, and turned out to be all right at rugby. And whereas I'd always thought I would uh, pursue, you know, academia, um, I ended up 
been in sixth form off and, and going to into the academy and and progressing through into rugby like that. So um, yeah, it wasn't. It certainly wasn't my intended career course, uh, but it seems that it's it's worked out all right. And can you explain the difference for people that don't know, myself included, uh, between rugby union and rugby league? Um, yeah, I mean the the only thing that's the same is that they've got the same shape ball. Um, that's about it. <laughs> the different amount of players, different rules, different size pitches. Um, rugby league's faster. Um, rugby union players are better paid. Um, rugby union. Um, it's probably a bigger sport, to be fair. It's um, it's it's played more up and down the country, although it's more of a southern thing. In the north, if you play rugby league, uh, rugby union, sorry, then you you're probably from a, a posh comprehensive school, um, whereas rugby league's a very state school thing. So, um, and and rugby league's very northern based as well. So one to posh, one isn't then, yeah. That that would be that's how I would sum it up, yeah. Got you. Got you. Now you started playing uh, professionally uh, when in two thousand and seven, and you didn't come out until twenty fifteen. Were you out to your teammates before you were out publicly? Um, about two months before, um, I was no, no. I I was married. I had kids. Um, I didn't didn't want to be gay. Didn't think I was gay. It was something that I struggled with for a um, big part of my life. Um, I, you know, bad struggle with my mental health. Um, contemplated suicide a few times. Um, got got really bad with drinking and, and all sorts. Not not a very nice person to be around. Um, and then eventually, you know, my marriage kind of came to an end. And, and with that came, the, I guess the I didn't need to keep up any appearances. I guess I don't I don't know. It came with a sense of freedom, and I kind of started to acknowledge that I was gay and rather than trying to suppress it um, which was obviously it was difficult for me to come to terms with and then I came out that was obviously had a massive impact on on my wife my kids um, and then obviously told everyone at rugby and a few a few months later it, it ended up being front page news um, I think it was a Sunday mirror um, so yeah I know that I'd not been out for a long time um, it was it just it went round like wildfire, and then the papers got hold of it. So, um, yeah, I don't. I, yeah, it just kind of happened like that, really. And did anything? Was there a catalyst? Was there anybody that inspired you to come out? What What made you decide to do it when you did? No, no, there wasn't. There wasn't a catalyst. It was just like I said, my marriage had ended because mainly because I was a bit. I was really struggling with mental health. I wasn't a nice person to be around, like I said, and. Um, with that, I guess, kind of came a sense of of relief, freedom. I, I don't really know. Um, there, there was no pre pretense, although that kind of implies that I knew that I was gay and I was just pretending all along. That wasn't the case. It was something that I just didn't think that I was gay. I thought, as I was growing up, I thought it was a phase that I go out of. I thought it'd go away. I thought you were supposed to get. I was always told you're supposed to get married. You're supposed to have kids. You know, gay people. In, in the town where I grew up, not that I knew of anyway. Um, you know, there, there weren't any role models. There certainly weren't any um, gay sportsmen. And I think Gareth Thomas came out a few years before in Rugby Union. Um, but I was so preoccupied with my own stuff. I didn't even, I didn't, that didn't even register on my radar until, until afterwards, later on coming out. Um, so no, it was just something that, it kind of happened. I guess I kind of got to breaking point where I kind of just went fuck it, um, and and, and that, that was that's kind of it really. And how did your family react to that? Um, not not great. Um, obviously, my wife struggled with it. Um, my kids were young, so they didn't really understand. Um, my my brother and sister were all right. My mum wasn't. Um, me and my mum stopped speaking for about five years and um, we've, we've only just started speaking again recently um so yeah i mean it, it was tough but uh, you know i was doing the right thing i was being true to myself and and you should never apologize for that i, I did that for 27 years so um yeah it, it wasn't easy but it was the right thing to do and I, I, 
you know, I, I, I suppose I wish I could have done it sooner, but then my life would have been different. I, you know, I might not have had my kids and, and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Uh, we'll come on to your rugby career in just a second, but um, I heard in one of your other interviews that you had a phone call from Elton John as well. Can you tell us a bit about how that came about? Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously, once it had come out in the in the newspaper, on the Monday I got a phone call um, uh, and it, it rang up and it was from Nice. Um, and I thought, oh, PPI. Um, and then once it had gone off, I thought, obviously, stuff going on in the paper yesterday, I thought, that seems odd, PPI is not from Nice, right? So I rung it back, a uh, French guy answered, I said, I've just had a phone call off this number, it's Keegan Erst. He said, hold on a minute. And then next thing, uh, El Elton, Elton John came on the phone, he said, hi, Keegan, Elton here. Uh, David and I want you to know, we think you're absolutely fabulous. Um, and then we had about a 10, 15 minute conversation, um, he said some really nice things spoke about you know the world changing and we've kept in contact ever since we we email quite regularly um his kids are the the same age as mine so yeah that was nice you know i've had a, a lot of positive role models um you know obviously elton got in touch elton was very kind um i'm now my best friend is anthony cotton um you know we, we're best friends I, I, i'm through him, I'm friends with Ian McKellen, who's been a, re a really inspirational role model. So, uh, been very, very lucky with the mentors and role models that I've had who've, who've given me my education, um, which is gay education. Nice, thanks for that. Uh, coming on to the sports side of things, you've done really well to make a living from the sport you love or you love now. Um, what advice would you give to others who are interested in kind of like, you know, non-traditional or kind of sporting careers? Um, just always remember that hard work beats talent. Um, what's the saying? Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Um, th there are so many things that you are, you know, people say it's all, it's all down to chance, but it's all, it's, it's all down to the hours that you put in and the sacrifices that you're willing to make, whether that's time, um, you know, I've missed friends' weddings, I've missed parties, I've not gone out, I've, you know, time going to the gym, training, all that kind of stuff. Um, you, you have to be willing to put that in and it has to mean enough to you to do it. Um, but, there, you know, the, people talk about, oh, it all depends on how talented you are, but there's so many things that when you sign in a professional contract that you get signed, you get signed on professionalism, you know, little things like punctuality, being coachable, um, the, the, you know, the list is, is endless compared to talent. You know, you can, you don't, you don't need to be that talented, you, but you need to be really hardworking, really coachable, really willing to learn, willing to take criticism, willing to put yourself out there, willing to put your body on the line. Um, you know, it's, it's all about getting that practice in. So just, if you really want to do it, you've got, to, you've got to commit hundred percent, um, and, and make no apologies for it. How much training do you have to do a week? Um, well, na now I'll, you know, we'll do three, four field sessions a week. There'll be three, four gym sessions a week. Um, but, you know, there's all the rehab you have to do away from that, looking after yourself. Obviously, we always have knocks. Um, you have to go in and get physio. If You, you know, little things like flush outs and, and stuff that you don't do at the club. You're expected to... Rug rugby is a sport of extras. You're expected to do things away from from the club, you know, as well as all your skills extras and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it, it's not as many hours as a, as a full-time job. It's pretty intense though. Um, and obviously you, you kind of have to front load that when you're younger, cause you have to get on, on top of that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite, and like I say, you, you give up summers, you know, your weekends, summers, holidays, seeing that, you know, I can't, don't take my son to training on an evening with training and, things like that, it's, it's little things like that that you have to, have to give up. Absolutely. And I can imagine that there's quite a lot of lucky routines and techniques that people use, or is there any kind of like little things that you guys do before games? Um, there, <laughs> there, are, there are a few that I've seen. I've had a few over the years. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't believe in any of that anymore. Um, but I mean, when I was- What did kid, you used to do? Well, when I was a kid before, I, <laughs> like I said, I was a fat kid. 
before I was any good at rugby, uh, we once played a game and I had some chips before the game. Um, and I played really well. So I thought, oh, that's it. I've got to have chips before every game. Um, it didn't work. Um, I've had a pair of a lucky pants that were horrendous, but I kept wearing them. Um, I've seen people who've got to put the shoes on in a certain order. They've got to get dressed at a certain time. They've got to drink, the, you know, so a certain stretch routine. You know, there's, there's literally all sorts of stuff that, that goes on. Now I just, you know, look after yourself day before prep drink enough water, eat, eat, eat the same food. You kind of get into a routine, but I wouldn't say it's a, a ritual. Do you know what I mean? And when you're not training, because it sounds like a lot, I mean, um, like Netflix, food, what's your kind of pig out things or what's your kind of relaxing things that you like to do? Drinking. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, just uh, hanging out with mates, going, going out to, to restaurants, going out to bars, what, whatever it might be, just, just regular stuff, really. Um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm very busy with, with my business now when I'm not, not training. So I spend, you know, I really enjoy doing that. So I spend a lot of time in that with, with the guys in there and coaching them. So, um, you know, I try to be, I try to be productive. I'm, I'm, I'm probably a bit harsh on myself. I don't, probably don't give myself enough downtime to be fair. Um, but yeah, when, when I do, it's usually involves gin. 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 And yeah. if it's food. What is it? Pizza? Is it kebabs? What, what's what's the guilty pleasure? Um, any and everything. You don't get to be six foot four and eighteen stone by being fussy when it comes to food. Nice. Um, so, as a gay dad myself, um, my kids sometimes have questions about being gay that I don't see kind of coming out of everywhere. And I've been kind of me and my partner have been bringing them up kind of over the years and all of that kind of stuff. Um, how did you approach this with your kids, and what was their kind of reaction? Um. So when I originally came out, my daughter was seven and my son was three. So my son doesn't actually remember me and his mum ever being together. Um, so my daughter's always kind of understood. She's always been okay with it. Um, she's, she's 12 now. Um, she's, she'll ask me about all sorts of stuff. But, you know, general, uh, just general... Being, generally being inquisitive, um, nothing out, out of the blue really that I wouldn't expect a 12 year old to ask. Whereas my son, um, he'll, he's asked me quite a few times, are you, st are you still gay dad? Um, if, <laughs> you know, we, you've not got a boyfriend, so you can't be gay. Um, so we've, we've had that kind of uh, discussion, but um, yeah, he's, uh, they, they, they're really cool with it. It's, it's been really easy for me. I don't, um, like I say, my son's never known any different and, and my daughter's really, really switched on and, and really keen to learn about, about everything. Really. She, likes, she, loves, she loves school, she loves learning, she loves learning about different cultures, different people, different backgrounds. So it's, it's, um, it's really easy to, to kind of talk to them. Yeah, I think it's one of those things, sorry, it's not in the question list, but I think it's one of those things that as a gay parent, it's why Pride Month kind of matters more and more because you do start to realise that kind of 364 days of the year, they're bombarded with male, female, male, female, heterosexual, heterosexual, heterosexual all the time. And sometimes it's like, you know, it's also why it's a shame this year that we're not actually doing something out there for Pride because I remember they came with us last year and they absolutely loved it. And they saw like men kissing, women kissing, every, like, you know, everybody having a great time and all of that kind of stuff. And it really normalized it for them. Right. And I think sometimes when they're at school and their friends ask them something, I always think they're cool with it. And then somebody will say something to them and it's almost like it's three years ago and then you've got to re-explain everything to them. Yeah, you yeah. must, being in the public eye, have you found a similar thing or? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just kind of obvious. I have some, you know, my best friends, uh, um, a, a gay couple and we go over to their house regularly so you know not that they see him kissing as such but the, it's it's not an alien concept for two men to to live together and um, you know go on holiday together spend you know sleep, sleep in the same room and and all that kind of stuff so it's it, it's not too bad with that and, and and you know they love them to bits and me and my daughter watch RuPaul together so it's there's lots of like gay references and you know i've got um there's, there's all sorts of stuff around the house and, and books and everything so the kids kind of see it regularly and i'm you know i'm i you know i'm very very proud of, of who i am and where i'm at and you know the kids the kids see that and 
it, 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 we've just got to set that example, haven't we? Absolutely, absolutely. Now moving on, uh, Drink Aware, you, you've done a lot for Drink Aware over the past couple of years. I mean, how did you get involved with that? I ain't, I ain't done anything with Drink Aware. I thought you had. Not Drink Aware, I've done loads of stuff with literally every other charity over the Drink Aware. <laughs> You've talked quite a lot about being aware of everything you can work with me here. <laughs> well, yeah, Seriously. I've had, I've, I've had problems, I've had pro you know, problems with, with drinking before I came out. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, w working with charities is something that I've, I've done a lot of. I've worked with Safa, I've worked with Stonewall, I've uh, worked with Sporting Force, a few military charities, um, you know, working with Albert Kennedy Trust and... Um, uh, diversity role models and, and all, all, all things like that I think you know being in a position of influence it's really important to to use that and, and to be able to try and give give something back um, especially when you know sometimes just that visibility is 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 a, a lot for for people to to help them get through what what they're struggling with so um, it's something that I'm, I'm really proud of is, is to be associated with with so many charities and to be able to to help other people. Absolutely, and you've done you continue to do a lot around mental health as well. Yeah, hundred percent. It's something that's mean. It, it's something that means a lot to me. I've, I've done spoke about it a lot within rugby. Um, I've done some work with Sporting Chance that work with athletes that are struggling with their mental health. Um, and I'm I'm a big um, advocate for talking about it. And you know, it, it's it's one of the big things that. I struggled with before I came out was my mental health was this idea that you couldn't be a rugby player and could uh, and be gay that you couldn't um, that, that you couldn't be a you know I, I know what I look like I know what I sound like and and there's this disparity in society that you're supposed to if you look like this you're supposed to behave like this and if you and it's something that a lot of men struggle with and they bottle up and there's a lot of shame involved in that and you know, I, I've made no secret. After I came out, I went and spoke to um, to a counsellor, and it was it was one of the best things that I've ever done. And I would highly recommend it to anybody. It really, really helped me. And um, just think that if the more we can talk about something uh, and have an open and honest conversation, because I'm not a fan of you know things like Twitter and, and call out, you know, the, the, this call out. Um, kind of situation that we're in where pe people can't say anything people can't you know it's all about the intent of what someone says and if someone's just you know saying something but they make a mistake then we should give them the benefit of the doubt and we should educate them just kind of reprimanding people for um for saying the wrong thing doesn't fix anything it just shuts conversations down before before they started so i'm a big advocate for for doing that in and around mental health and, and talking about sexuality and things where you know sometimes a lot of people don't know any any better i know that when i came out i'm the only gay person that a lot of my rugby playmates know um so i'm their only source of um knowledge education link with you know our community so it's it's really important that we allow those conversations to happen whatever they're around yeah, absolutely. I think it was one of those things, and even setting up an LGBT group, I mean, one of the things that happened when we were setting up was sometimes we had a queue on the end, sometimes we didn't, and then I sent out an email and it had the whole LGBTQPI, the rest of it, that I'm not going to make a face about because it's going to make me sound like I'm being flippant, but I'm not. And I actually had lots of shitty emails that came back around the fact that people thought I was taking the piss, and I'm not taking the piss, it just is that you don't you want to include everybody but then you don't include everybody and, if, if we're, and like if we're getting it wrong then i think everybody should you know I get think, it wrong a bit as well i think like pe pe what people need to remember is who who is the bad guy like are, are you sending that email are you the bad guy no you're not and it's you know we, we're trying to represent people although people ain't being represented but trying to further you know <laughs> increase our visibility our, um, our, our, our say in the world in things that you know how, how things are, are done and, and making sure that our voice is heard and ultimately if we spend all that all our time bickering between each other because someone misses some letters off something someone says something that they didn't know you know everybody makes mistakes and it's, it's as I always say like you can't shout at a kid who's never been taught something 
for getting something wrong. And it's the same with an adult, you know, just because they're 30, 40 years old doesn't mean they've ever had an education or been taught about, you know, I didn't know what the Stonewall riots were until I came out and I was told about it. Um, so when, when you say to someone, you know, people say, oh, don't you know your history? And they go, well, no, I've never been taught it. So you, you've, you've got to have that open mind and be willing to do that. And, and people are quick to take offense to everything. And, and that's what I was saying about that call out culture stuff. Absolutely. And um, now, um, Thomas Beatty, for those of you who are watching who don't know, Thomas Beatty is a professional footballer who I think is the second footballer to come out as being gay. Um, um, do you know Thomas or, and what advice would you kind of give him? Um, I, I've spoken to Thomas a few times before he came out. Um, I think I think there's been quite a few that have come out since um, stopping playing. They all seem to do it after they stop playing um, for whatever reason. Uh, but yeah, I've spoken to Thomas few times um and it was you know it was something that he struggled with and and that that dichotomy of can i be a sportsman and be gay does one have to happen at the expense of, of the other um so yeah i mean just you, you've just got to do what's right for you whether you, whether you come out whether you want to be you know quite vocal about it or whether you you want to get on with your life and, and do you just by living an open and authentic life and you're moving the, you know, you, you're pushing the needle forward, however much it may be. So, um, yeah, you, you just got to do what, what feels right for him and what he's comfortable with doing. Absolutely. Now, when you, I think it was the first game you played when you came out, you ended up getting photographed wearing kind of like quite a lot of pink. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about that situation? Yeah, so the club that I was at at the time, if you Google me, I think it's like the first picture that comes up. Um, the uh, if at the time uh, I was playing for Batley, my hometown club, I was captain, and once a year, every year, they're playing a pink kit to raise money for breast cancer um, because the chairman's wife, who's sadly died now, um, I had breast cancer about three times, um, and she did a lot to raise money for it. And one weekend, it was just called the Pink Weekend, where they tried to raise as much money for breast cancer as they could. Now, I knew that the story was coming out. It kind of got turned around quite fast. Um, and it just happened to be this Sunday where it was the Pink Weekend at Batley. So we were playing in a pink kit. Obviously, there was a lot of press there because it had come out. And lo and behold, there were lots of pictures of me in a pink kit, which everyone assumed Batley had done <laughs> For me, it was just the stars of the stars of the line, <laughs> or not aligned, however you want to look at it. It must have been pretty intimidating before you walked out on that pitch, no? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't know if anyone was going to say anything. I didn't know what the crowd was going to be like. I didn't know what the opposition players were going to be like. Um, so, yeah, there was quite a, quite a lot of nerves. Um, but it ended up being completely fine. and, and never, Nobody ever said anything. Nobody has ever said anything. Um, within you know within the opposition teams or anything, so it's I've been really lucky with the the reception that I've had. And um, do you think that's a, something which is because I mean a lot of people talk about macho sports and you couldn't really get much more macho than rugby. Do you know what I mean? But do you think it's something about rugby that it's more accepting or you've got better relationships? Do you think it's harder in other sports? Um, I think I think there's a few things. With rugby, it's certainly rugby league. It's very, you know, that when you're stepping out there, you're putting your body on the line, and anybody who's going to do that, there's a kind of respect for. So, you know, whether they're good or not, um, so there's a certain level of respect there, regardless of what they do away from the pitch. There's also, you know, I'd been playing for quite a long time, and a lot of people knew me and knew what I was about, and you know, you kind of tend to know it. All the players kind of tend to know each other, so I've always got on with everyone. I've, I've never really had any issues with anybody. So I think that certainly played a part. And, and as well with rugby league, you know, it's a working class game. We're working class people and whoever comes, you know, whatever colour the skin, whatever the religion, rugby league can't be choosy. And it's never been choosy about who plays it. And it's always been, uh, if you're good enough to put a pair of boots on, we'll have you. So, um, yeah, I think there's, there's there's a few things at play with, with rugby, uh, and maybe that transpires into rugby union a little bit. Um, whereas maybe in football they can afford to be a bit more picky. I, I don't know. There's mob mentality and everything in football. There's lots of different things at play there. 
Absolutely. And just keeping in mind, I mean, as I mentioned just before we started, like, you know, as with the Mark Foster interview last week, I mean, about 600 people have viewed that now and about 100 of those are in the Middle East. Um, and you've got to assume one positive thing with doing this in a webinar format as opposed to getting people to turn up. It's like whenever we do an LGBT event, we always get like 300 people who are like, I'm going to come, I'm going to come, I'm going to come. And lots of people are coming on their own. And then you always end up getting maybe about a third of people actually materialize on the day. And I always think with that, that it might be because people don't want to, are scared or they're intimidated or they don't want to come along. And like, I mean, I've done that before as well. When I was coming out about kind of turning up something, getting to the front door and then turning on my heel and walking away because you just thought I can't do it. Yeah. Um, because this is a webinar format and people obviously feel more safe and more secure and they can watch it and all of that kind of stuff. You know, when you were coming out, did you have any difficulties? Did anyone treat you differently? Um, no, no, nobody treated me any differently other than, you know, obviously what I've spoken about with my family and everything. Uh, the lads at rugby were really good. Um, this, the coach was fantastic. The, the club were fantastic. Um, a lot, and I think a lot of it is when we come, when any of us come out, it's, it, 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 it's, we just catastrophize and we always think of, we, as human beings, we always think of the worst case scenario. I'm going to be so, you know, I always thought I'm going to be disowned. No one's going to want to talk to me. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to end up on the streets. I'm going to end up homeless and, and then I'll end up lonely and dead. Um, which is ridiculous when you think back, but when you're in the the heat of the moment and you, and you're, you can't see the woods for the trees. And um, I think, Sometimes it just takes a bit of perspective. Like looking back, I think, you know, it was ridiculous to think, you know, that I'd, a, a, anything bad would happen or the guys would re react negatively. Like, you know, that they, they love me. And um, so it was, yeah, I mean, no, I, I didn't, I wasn't treated any different, but I, I thought that I would be. And I think, you know, that is ultimately what stops people coming out. And that's why I always say you can only do it when you're ready. And for me, it will get into a point where you just thought, do you know what? I don't care um, because I'm fed up of living like this. So um, different people have different tipping points, I guess. Absolutely. And is there anything that surprised you about coming out that was kind of more more positive than you imagined it to be? Um, I suppose the, the 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 press coverage was quite surprising. <laughs> um, you know, I was just a rugby league player from from the ass over nowhere, so. You know, when when it was front page news, and the, the, there were people like Emma Watson and Elton and Ian and Anthony getting in touch, and people talking about it. You know, going on TV show, you know, Good Morning Britain, and, and all that kind of stuff. It was just like a bit of a whirlwind. Um, but the reaction was positive. I've still got letters upstairs that I was sent. You know, from 50, 60, 70 year old guys who'd never come out, who'd never been brave enough to do it, who said that they wish they'd had a role model like me. And I, I, you know, I always remember thinking and saying actually at the time, I said, you know, I don't want to go on any kind of crusade. I don't want to be any kind of pin up I, I, for gay sports people. I just want to get on with my life. I was in the middle of going through a divorce and, you know, leaving the house and everything. So, it was a bit full on at the time, but then, you know, getting those letters, getting the messages and emails that I've had that I still get, you know, I, I know how important it is to, for that visibility, for that, for some, to be a role model to someone. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, I get a lot of fulfillment out of being able to do that for, for other people. So I guess, and like I said, anybody, whether you've got any level of notoriety or not, um, just by being out proud and living your, your life, you are, moving the needle forward for other people and making it easier for other people in the future. So I, I guess that would be the, the, the big positive that's come out of it for me. Yeah. Um, now if you weren't doing rugby, what would you, what would you be doing? Um, well, obviously now I'm, I'm coaching. Um, so that, that is what I'll be doing after I finish. Um, before I got into rugby, I always thought I'd end up with a, a job with a suit. So I didn't know what it would be. Um, I'd always fancied being a, a, a lawyer or I, I said a doctor when I was younger, but my mum once put casualty on and I was like, that's not for me. Um, so yeah, I, I, now it'll, I, you know, I, I really enjoy coaching and being able to help guys um, do that. And it's obviously, you know, all the experience I've got with rugby is really helps with that. Um, 
but yeah, pre rugby it would have been. I think I had dreams of like moving off to a big city and uh, chasing, chasing the you know where the streets are paved with gold. Nice. Um, and for those that don't know, I mean, is it personal coaching? Is it PT? Like, what, what's the coaching that you're doing at the moment? Is it online? Yeah, so I do online coaching. Um, we have an amazing community of guys. Obviously, the physical side of things. So I help people get in, in, in amazing shape. But we also do a lot of stuff on on mindset, on leveling up confidence, on working on you know dismantling self doubt, and um, you know a lot of my clients are gay guys, and I know how they struggle with. There's a, a, a perception that you have to look a certain way in the gay community, which is something I, I became very aware of after I came out. Um, uh, so it's just the guys who who need some help, need assistance, uh, and and ultimately transforming lives. Like I always say, I'm in the business of transforming lives, not not just transforming physiques. Like anybody can change the physique. It's ultimately about helping people improve their lives. So um, yeah, it's something that I'm really passionate about and really really love doing. Um, and the guys that we've got on the program are, are fantastic. We've got a nice little tribe. Excellent. And um, what's the name of the company? Uh, PTIQ. Um, you, if you see, go onto my Instagram page. You'll see all the you know guys' results and, and things like that. There's there's some amazing stuff on there. Great. Thank you, Stephen. A uh, little plug there. <laughs> um, now, um, last question from me, and then we'll move on to kind of like because there's quite a bit that's built up in comments in the Q and A, but. Being a role model must be quite a big responsibility. What's the best thing and the worst thing about it? I mean, especially when it comes to dating, that must be tough, right? Um, yeah, being a role model is... Uh, I don't know, really. It's it's something that I'm very privileged to, to do. Like, you know, I suppose you could say it can be a bit of a... Some people might look at it and think it might be a bit of a burden. You've got to be on point and you know but it's just about being a decent human being which i would like to think that i am anyway so it's um being able to help somebody and i always say that when you somebody reaches out to someone that's a really brave thing to do um to ask for help is is you know a really strong brave thing to do so to be in a position to tell someone that and help them is is a, a massive privilege and uh, something I'm, I'm really lucky to to be. With regards to dating, um, I haven't really done that much of it. I've, I've not been single for that for that long. So um, obviously no dating in lockdown. So I'll have to get back. I'll have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> nice. Uh, right now, we're going to start with some easy questions. Stuart's asking who your favourite drag queen from RuPaul's Drag Race is. Which series? <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know. We've got, it's got to be Bianca Del Rio, hasn't it? Um, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a few good ones. Last season's was really good. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> nice. And then Jose um, has asked. Um, I think you touched a little bit on this before, but this is from a slightly different slant. Um, coming out has turned you into both an icon and a role model for a lot of people. There are very few out professional sports people. What are the positives and learnings you'd share with other sports people or indeed anyone who's thinking about coming out? Um, yeah, I mean, that's very kind of them to say. <laughs> um, I think it's just about, you've just got to be honest. Like people can see, um, people are not stupid. and People can see people who are bullshitting, who are not being authentic, who are... There's just something off and people can tell. Maybe they, they can't tell what they can tell, but they can always tell. So it's just about being honest, um, being being authentic. Do that when you're ready to do it. Um, you know, something someone always told me was, you don't have to tell the truth, but never lie. So, you know, if if don't, don't make stuff up, don't try and kid people. Um, just don't say anything if you don't want to say anything. Um, and I think that, you know, that's been a big lesson for me. You don't to just be be honest and be authentic, which is, um, I sometimes do that to a, to a fault. <laughs> and um, Yasmin's asked, uh, what advice would you give to your 20 year old self? Um, don't get married to a woman. Um, I don't know, it's, it, like I said, it's difficult because obviously I had, to be fair, I, I had my daughter, she was born when I was 20, um, which was very young. Um, 
so I mean, like I said, I would never wish to not have my kids. Um, and then on the on the flip side, that would also wish to not put my you know my ex-wife through everything that she went through. So I think whether I was twenty or ten or whatever, to anybody who's young, just you've got to live by your values. You've not got to try and when people become dissatisfied, when people start drinking, taking drugs, doing whatever they're doing, it's because they're not living life by the values and, and what means the most to them. And they're living by other people's values. And when you start, when you do that, it, it doesn't sit well with you and you have to find something to kind of redress that, which is always, always something destructive. So, um, yeah, whoever you are, whatever you age, you are live by your values. And if, Always remember, if somebody's got a problem, it's their problem, uh, not yours. And, and, and feel free to, to, to say you don't want to answer this, but there's a couple of questions that have come in about how you've managed to get your mum to be more understanding and on side. Um, I, th I think time obviously mellows people. You know, five years later, she's 50-odd now. Uh, we've not spoken for a long time. You know, the dust has settled and... Um, I, I think she just, you know, we had, we had a conversation and she just kind of apologized, you know, was, was, and he's doing the best to put it right. Um, so, you know, you've got to, it's easy to hold someone over a barrel. You know, you've, if someone wants to make something right, you've got to give them the opportunity to do that. So, um, yeah, that's kind of, you know, we've been speaking for about six months, no, a bit less than six months now. Um, but my mum, my mum lives in Grand Canary, so it's not like I can see her often anyway. So, uh, but yeah, we speak speak pretty regularly, um, and it's just a case of rebuilding that relationship, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, David's asked a question about how do you help your personal training clients avoid body dysmorphia, which is quite prevalent in LGBT communities, and focus on self confidence and um, goal achievement. Yeah, so you kind of touched on it before. We, it's not just a case that you know. I'm, I'm really proud that it's a it's a very holistic plan. Um, it's not just let's get you looking amazing and neglect everything else. Um, the training is like the cherry on, on on top. It's all about changing those limiting beliefs, changing your mindset, changing what you think is achievable, changing again, adjusting those values and and what pe people presume is right and how they should look, as opposed to what's realistic, where they're at, setting expectations. And like I said, we have an amazing community of other guys who are in the same boat and, and they share the wins, they share the lessons and learning from other people going through the same things and seeing that you're not alone is, is really powerful. So it's, it's something that we, we really focus on and I'm, I'm really proud of. You know, like I said, it's easy to just churn out people getting a good result. Anybody can do that. Um, but it's about managing this first um, and, and working on that. Good. And Haley's asked a question about um, how do you prefer, prepare mentally for a sporting challenge? Um, I, it's just a case of making sure that I've done everything that, that um, I can do in preparation. So eating right, um, ex knowing that I've trained when I should train, making sure that I've, I've slept right and, and being, being protective of, of my time and my energy. Um, you know, which is something that I kind of pass on to my guys is we're very, we're all of us really quick to take on work that we shouldn't take on, say yes to things that we shouldn't say yes to, do things that we don't need to do. Um, and we've got to be, and it's something that I learned, you know, quite young as an athlete is that you've got to be protective of your time and your energy. Um, and sometimes that doesn't fit in with other people, but you've got to be okay with boundaries uh, and establishing boundaries. Um, so yeah, as long as I, I've, done you know what i need to do and look after myself it's i, I you know I've, I've been doing it for so long now um you know for like 14 years um it's it, it, the, the nerves and stuff don't really that's not really an issue anymore it's just making sure that i've prepped um properly because i'm 32 now i'm starting to creep a little bit and you mentioned with the online training state of things that when you finish how, how much longer do you think you'll continue playing rugby for I'm going to do one more year next year and then I'm done. I've got, a, I've got a testimonial year next year. I'm going to have my testimonial uh, and then I'm going to retire. Yeah. Cause you should, you, always, still play. you should always retire when people are telling you that you shouldn't, you don't want to retire when people are telling you that you should. 
Yeah, I can imagine it must get a bit sore, bloody hell. Olivia has asked a question about uh, what more can be done uh, at a youth level in rugby and I guess in other sports as well to um, promote equality um, when you're learning a sport? Um, well, obviously, a lot of it comes from um, the coaches and the coaches setting that example and, and that comes from them being educated. Um, so that, that should be, you know, part of their coaching course and there's a lot of things, you know, with equality that, you know, I've been into multiple corporations uh, and big, you know, big businesses and, and spoken to people about diversity and inclusion. And something that I'm really passionate about is that when I do go in to talk to people or when people are learning about diversity, inclusion, um, you know, and what, wherever that, whatever we're talking about on that scope, whether it's LGBT, LGBT stuff, whether it's, um, to do with uh, you know gender equality, whether it's to do with racism, it's important that people don't just pay lip service, and it's not just ticking boxes. Um, and the, there is a kind of thing around that and mental health and everything that we need to do it to to say that we've done it, but we're just paying it a bit of lip service. And I think making sure that when people do it, they realise the impact that it has. Um, and I think because it has an impact on such a limited amount of people. You know, a coach who coaches, you know, an age, five different age groups might only have one gay kid. Um, but it's, it's his job to look after every single kid and, and be able to um, to help them and guide them uh, and to set a good example. So it's really important that even though they are catering to the majority, that they have to be able to incorporate the minority. That's what, that's what I think is, is really important with, yeah, with, with youth stuff, with business stuff anything you know we, we shouldn't i think it's ridiculous to say that all minorities you know you've got to pander to 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 every minority because that's just not feasible but like i said cater to the majority but facilitate for the minority yeah absolutely uh, another question is coming from emma again like feel free to answer or not but um how did your experience with your father impact the kind of father you want to be with your kids um yeah good question yeah i never uh, i never met my dad haven't met my dad. Um, he split up with my mum before before I was born. So I tried contacting him a few times when I was a kid growing up. He, he didn't want to get he didn't want to um, get in touch, which I suppose is a good thing. He didn't come in and out of my life. Um, and I suppose looking back, a big thing, of, a big driving force behind me having kids was that I wanted to prove that I was better than him, um, which isn't necessarily the best reason to have kids. Um, but yeah, I think that that's certainly been a big impact on on how I am as a dad and how you know involved I am and you know wanting to be there and and, and be a, a good dad for my kids. It's um, that was certainly a big uh, a big driving factor, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And last question, uh, which is coming anonymously: Do you have any advice for people who are trying to start a conversation about diversity inclusion? or trying to set something up in their workplace or their community or whatever it might be? How would you get something like that started? Yeah, whenever, you, yeah, whenever you're trying to get across something, you've got to make it appealing to the people that you're getting across to. So it's, it, you know, you can throw some facts and, and figures at them. You know, people, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it's a really high percentage of um, kids who come out of university, who've come out at university, go back into the closet. Um, and anyone who's come out of the closet knows just how much mental capacity that takes up. And if you're thinking about that, you're not bringing your authentic self to work, then you're not going to be working as effectively as you could. So when you when people set up diversity and inclusion groups and um, you know it's a, a movement within a company and it gets people involved, even though it might only be, I always sell it as it's not going to affect the people it doesn't in, involve. And the people it does involve, it's going to make them perform better. Um, and if any company doesn't want their workers to perform better, then that's not a very good business model, is it? So, um, you know, you've got, you've got to sell it to, to them as them. And it's also, you know, it's also 2020 um, and we should have one. <laughs> <laughs> good advice. Thanks very much for that, Keegan. I think that's all the questions and all the questions from me. I mean, if there's any last pieces of advice, anything like that, you would kind of like want to shout out to people? Um, no, I think we've covered it all. Just like I said, don't try to live by anybody else's values. Do you and don't apologize for it. 
and if someone else has got a problem, it's their problem. Fuck them. And what are you going to do for Pride next year? Um, well, I've always gone to, I love Manchester Pride. Um, that was the first Pride that I ever went to. So obviously I go there in, um, in August. That's in August. Um, Leeds is my local one. It just depends when rugby games are, whether I can go to them and stuff. But I think, I think Pride's great. I love it. So there's no, is August, do you think it'll be on for August or no? No, I think this year, I, I think it's been cancelled for this year, but um, the, you, the, the gays can't social distance. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that'll be on this year, but next year um, we'll be back with a bang, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Keegan, thanks very much for joining us. Much appreciated. Thanks, Ed. Having me, appreciate it. Cheers.